have your Bibles with you, we're going to look at 1 Peter chapter number 2. 1 Peter chapter number 1, rather. If I can hand that to me, thank you. And uh, God is so good. We started a series last week regarding the subject matter of the significance of being a Christian. As I look across our church, I look across the community. I think one of the areas that we take for granted, and the area, one of the biggest areas that we take for granted, is the fact that if you're not careful and you live in this little bubble, you believe everybody believes like you do, and uh, you get shocked when you hear certain things and and, uh, that type of stuff. But here's the biggest issue Are you really saved? Do you know Christ as your Savior? And we find in this church all the time as years go on that people will sit in a pew, they will hear a message, and they'll kind of get it, but they're not not saved. And that kind of launched into this series. I know our teens have been really speaking on that. We've had a couple come to know Christ as their Savior. We have some baptisms coming forward and we had uh, in our church itself, and we, we really need to be careful that we don't become so full of ourselves and our programs and what we do that our community never hears the gospel of Jesus Christ. Amen? And I thought about this, and if you are a Christian, what is the significance of being a Christian? And that's where this series starts. Let's look at the Word of God this morning. We're in 1 Peter chapter number 2. Look at verse number 9. Peter is speaking to a group of persecuted, maligned people that have accepted Christ. And this chapter, this entire first epistle of uh, first Peter, rather, is really to a group of people that just are under attack. Maybe another word to say it is all guns are blazing and they're aimed at them. And he sits here and he's trying to, I believe, encourage them. Look at verse number nine. He goes, but ye are a chosen generation a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people. And the reason you're under attack is because of that very thing. That you should show forth the praises of Him who have called you out of darkness into His marvelous light. Which in time past you were not a people, but are now the people of God which had not obtained mercy, but now have attained mercy. Mercy. I want to preach a message I've simply titled this morning on the subject matter of a new belonging. Let's pray together, please. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time. We thank you for the Lord Jesus Christ. I pray, Lord, you would guide and direct in this message. I pray for that soul that's near as hell. I pray for that Christian that is down and discouraged and, Lord, needs a the Holy Spirit to lift them up in this morning. Lord, I pray for that. Guide and direct as only you can. Fill me with the Holy Spirit. And we'll thank you for it. In Christ's name I pray. Amen. And amen. I want you to turn if you can. If we're continuing on. I want you to go to Psalm chapter number 100. Psalm 100. We're talking about the subject of belonging. The significance of being a Christian is the belonging. You belong to God. You belong to God. I never forget as a child growing up, it was always a dream that I had to play under a light in a a high school football game on Friday night. I never forget the high school that I went to. By the way, we're having our 40th and our wedding, our 40th class reunion this year. And I, by the way, just a little side note: I'm looking at all the people on the Facebook site. They started for our 40th reunion, and guess what? 
everybody there is really old. I look at my, I said, look, I feel young. I mean, I'm just getting started, you know. But anyway, I remember as I was playing, our high school had 3,000 students. We had just under, I think, 700 in our graduating class. It was a large class. We're a 5A high school. We put people in Division I, uh, signed University of Florida, University of Georgia, Florida State, which wasn't much of a school back then as far as football. But it was a, a very difficult program to break into. They'd have over 100 try out for the team about 60 would make it and i never forget my sophomore year i got to put on that jersey i got to put on the red jersey the wolf pack i put on the helmet at number 21 which was my hero jim kick from the miami dolphins during the 70s and and i was so excited and i felt like i finally belonged to somebody or a group rather i had a belonging and i was a part of a team I never forgot going to getting out on the field and, and hearing the band play as we broke the banner. And I said, well, I was a sophomore. The two guys that were seniors had already gotten scholarships to play at one at University of Tennessee. He was a quarterback there for a while, uh, Salt Marsh. And I said, I'm not going to get in. I never forget when he said, Ayers, get over here. By the way, we didn't have the political correctness then, you know. Um, I'll tell you that story. And i never forget, they actually called me, and I got to go into the game, and I, I felt like I belonged. We were a team. Look what Psalm 100 says in regards to God. Know ye that the Lord, He is God. It is He that hath made us, and not are we ourselves. We are His, what? Say it. People and the sheep of His pasture. In the Hebrew there, that last phrase really means we are His. We are His sheep. We belong to God because He made us to be part of His very own people. He continues to watch over us as our Good Shepherd. This simple truth, look here, ought to transform your lives. And what we need with our young people and those that are young raising families and the children and the teens and all the others ought to know that this simple truth can transform our lives and should shape everything we do. It's a, it's, in many ways, it can be a profound reshaping of our self-worth. We matter because the Creator of the universe, we're part of His family. We belong to God. And all our other roles in life must be seen in the light of this primary reality that we belong to God. Everything. Christianity is not something you turn on and turn off like a light switch when you come into the room or you leave. And that's the way even in many Christian homes it is treated. It's a game changer. It was for me. In 1988, when I received Christ as my Savior, I praised God some ways. I wasn't raised in a church where everything was wrong. I, it was all new to me, and it changed everything. It changed how I raised my family. It changed my thoughts. It changed my checkbook. Everything changed overnight. Because I belong to God. Let's look at it this way. All other roles in our life must be seen in the light of this primary reality that we belong to God. And this can be so encouraging, man, when you're going through some tough, tough times. You may be a lawyer or manager. We've got a lot of medical people here, a lot of professionals. We have a lot of factory workers, whatever you're in. But you are first and foremost one of God's people. You may be a father or a mother or a friend, but you're first and foremost one of God's people. And the good news of the Gospel is that nothing can ultimately keep us away from God. Nothing. Turn to Romans chapter 8. Let's walk through this real quickly. Romans chapter 8. And we're going to stay in Romans 6 for a portion of this message. So you might as well stay there. The Apostle Paul wrote, writes in Romans chapter 8, verse number 38 and 39. For I am persuaded 
that neither death nor life nor angels nor principalities nor powers nor things present nor things to come nor height nor depth nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the, say in the next word, love of God. That's so encouraging when you're struggling, isn't it? When life hurts. When people disappoint you, when a loved one passes away. I was driving up here yesterday and uh, I was on the way to Walmart. How many go to Walmart? Raise your hand. Yeah, who doesn't go to Walmart? Somebody said we had to have church service in Walmart so people would visit us every week. Anyway. And I noticed a motorcycle had, a guy had lost control and he was laying down, him and his girlfriend or whatever, they were there. And I put my flashers on, got in the car, spun around. And I helped him lift it up. And of course, I could smell alcohol on his breath. And he had been drinking. And you know what I used to think? I used to think, shame on him. But recently... Not recently, I guess it's always been there. I just felt sorry for him. I said, you know, I'm a pastor at Walnut Creek Baptist Church. Let me help you. I picked up his bike and he said, thank you, sir. Thank you for helping me. I didn't see the alcohol in his breath. What I saw is somebody that could have been Fred and Ann Ayers on that bike. And that person needed the Lord. I helped him get off his bike and I guess he was embarrassed because he got behind me. He didn't want to pass me. I was driving slow and um, whatever. But he, he just sat behind me and I pulled into Walmart. He went on down the road. But here's the point. I belong to God. And God saves me and loves me. But that doesn't give me any right to be condemning or hallow when it comes to other people that need the Lord. And just because you belong to God does give you no right to refuse to help others or to somehow look here, every eyeball on me to think you're better than everybody else. John MacArthur said it right. He said in American Christianity, we have made our mission field the enemy. Let's walk through this if we can. How you live and act in each of these roles that we talked about will be shaped by your primary relationship to God as someone who belongs to Him. First of all, I want to show you something we've already... You're special to God. Go back to 1 Peter chapter 2. I just had it on the screen. But go back to 1 Peter chapter 2. I'll let you find it and we'll kind of transgress and we'll unpack this. You're special to God. A new belonging means we're special. You're God's own special people. Now look what the text says. But ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, peculiar people, that you should show forth the praises of Him who hath called you out of darkness into His marvelous light. Special. You're special to God. God cares for you and loves for you, loves you. I was thinking this week, uh, I had my grandkids here. I had one time I had four of them here, I think four or five of them. Maybe we have four or five here. Five here. I can't keep track after four, who knows, you know. But anyway, I had five of them here at one time. And my thing was is when I would go out and it'd be, you know, a boatload of my hair and here, I'm just trying to find the one and I knew what they're wearing. I'd track them down because they're very special. I want to see. If they're joining themselves, if they're, if they're happy or unhappy, are they laughing? Uh, I, I need to know where they are and when they brought their take-home sheets uh, for the evening and they had certain, are they filling them out? Because these are my grandkids. And that's the way God 
deals with us. We're very special to Him. That text there in 1 Peter chapter 2, let me go back and put it on the screen as well, is, was written to God's nation, a chosen generation. It was reserved really for the physical nation of Israel. A royal priesthood, a holy nation, His own special people. But now, it applies to us. Deuteronomy 10.15 says this, Only the Lord hath delight in thy fathers to love them, and He chose their seed after them, even you above all people as it is this day. What had become limited only to the nation of Israel is now possible to all people, according to 1 Peter chapter 2, all people who are in Christ as promised to Abraham. You're one of us. God loves you. He died for you. You're one of His children. And this is a special blessing, a new belonging. Before you didn't belong, now you do. It's like this. The Marines have a code. And I'm not sure it's a written code, but I believe it may be. And maybe the other branches of the military have it as well. If you are in battle, they leave nobody behind. An injured soldier is not left behind. You wait. You wait till the re- you don't leave a wounded soldier there for the enemy to take them. You leave. You make sure this code that you have with you and your buddies, and your battalion, or your particular group, they wait. We found that in Somalia, that didn't work out too well, and they took some of the uh, Marines. And they killed them and wound up using them as kind of a, a, a propaganda for their cause. And I thought about that as I thought about God. God is, we're special. We're special to God. And think about this. As he writes in 1 Peter chapter 2, he says, you are royal priesthood, a holy nation. A chosen generation. I think of that. He called us out of darkness into His marvelous light. He showed us mercy and made us the people of God. Turn to 2 Peter chapter 1. 2 Peter chapter 1. Because He called us out of darkness and His marvelous light, and showed his mercy, there's some responsibility. Look at 2 Peter chapter 1. Look at verse number 8, please. For these things be in you and abound. Now, this is good. That they make you that ye shall neither be barren or unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. But look at verse 9. But he that lacketh these things is blind and cannot see afar off and have forgotten that he was purged from his old sins. Wherefore, the rather brethren, give diligence to make your calling and election sure. If you do these things, you shall never fall. For so an entrance shall be ministered unto you abundantly and to the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior. It's called growth. If you want to sin, there's going to be spiritual growth. And spiritual growth allows you to understand, number one, that your calling is sure, but you'll never be unfruitful or barren. Grow up, Christian. Get off the milk and onto the meat. You're special to God. Why do you think we want people to read their Bibles and go in their devotions and to get into the meat of God's Word? so we won't be unfruitful or barren. Think about this. It's interesting. If you have a license to practice a profession in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, and sometimes if you don't have a license, let's say there's certain fields. I'll just say my field, I'm an engineer. I have a PE license. And because I have that license, and because, I let it expire, but i got to worry about that. But because of that license, I have to take continuing education credits. Now, I won't get into the justification of that, but the world sees 
that your education never stops. That's why I tell people, readers are learners, learners are readers, and readers are leaders. If you don't read, you will not learn, and you will never lead. That's why our kids got to get off the Xbox and off the video games, and they need to understand, not just in the Word of God, to move forward and be a leader and a reader, because a leader does read. And by the way, you look at those that are doing well in all aspects of life, there's one common knowledge. They don't watch TV. I'm talking young people, millennials now. They don't play video games. They read. And as a Christian, we ought to take a note of that. We ought to be leaders and we ought to understand we want to get into the depths of God's Word. As an engineer, I have to take continuing education credits. I have to constantly be expounding, looking for what's going out there, what the new technologies are. As a Christian, you ought to be getting into God's Word and becoming discipled and growing in grace. Because you're special to God. No doubt about that. As we find in 1 Peter chapter number 2. Secondly, and this is so relieving. Oh, How many of you ever just had to take a deep sigh of relief and go, oh, that's good. That's good. You ever been in pain and all of a sudden, whatever they prescribed you kicked in? Oh! By the way, don't get hooked on that stuff, all right? Turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 3. You're free! Do you know, do you understand this? Do you really understand it? I'm free to serve. Now look what it says in 2 Timothy, excuse me, 2 Corinthians 3, and then we're going to go to Romans. Remember I told you to go to Romans 6, which is the classic chapter on this subject. Now the Lord is that Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is what? You're not under legalism. You're not under bondage. You're not under the do's and don'ts. You're not under the issues of... By the way, the do's and don'ts sometimes become such a bondage in our movement, it destroys the fabric of Christianity of things you shouldn't be doing. And maybe you shouldn't be doing those things, but the whole reason you're not doing them is because of bondage and legalism. It's ridiculous. And then we got the other side that, you know, we'll talk about that in a few minutes. I'll get to that in Romans. The freedom in Christ is seen in contrast to the bondage of sin. Now I want you to go to Romans chapter 6. Romans 6. I told you we'd go there. Go to Romans chapter 6. Freedom. Now, don't miss this. By the way, freedom is a basic human desire, so we'd expect to read about in the Bible, and it's there. Freedom is Christ is seen in contrast to the bondage of sin. Now, look what it says in verse number 20 of Romans chapter 6. And we'll work our way backwards, and I'll try to unpack this as best as I can. For when ye were the servants of sin, you were free from righteousness. Now, don't miss this. We try to clean up and make unrighteous people righteous. And we say, don't do this, don't do this, don't do this, don't do this. By the way, your hair better be cut, you better be wearing this, da-da-da-da-da. They're not, they don't even know the Lord. And by the way, some of that's not even scriptural anyway. As I say, it's our 67th book of the Bible we'd like to add in. But look what it says. What? Fruit have ye in those things whereof you are now ashamed. And he's talking to save people. For the end of these things is death. But now be made free from sin and become servants to God, ye have fruit unto holiness and the end, and in the end, everlasting life. And then we find the verse that we always use in salvation, which, by the way, 
is after the statements I just read, the Bible verses, excuse me, the chapter designations and the verse designation were added into the Bible centuries after the Word of God was penned somewhere, and don't quote me, you may be able to Google this and find it sooner. I think it was around the 8th or 9th century. So Romans 3.23 was a continuation of what I just read. Let me just say this. In other words, sin enslaves people for spiritual death and eternity apart from God. That's sin. Knowing Christ provides the freedom from control of sin and guarantees eternal life with Him. We're no longer under the bondage of sin. That's freedom. Freedom in Christ is seen as the only true form of freedom because it provides lasting freedom beyond this life, beyond here and now. John 8.36 says this, if the, son, if the Son therefore shall make you free, you shall be free indeed. We experience true freedom by knowing Him, walking His ways, and engaging with the changes as He brings them our way. No doubt about that. And yes, there are things that are sinful that are clearly defined in the Bible that we shouldn't do. No doubt about that. That makes you unrighteous, a carnal Christian, away from the Lord if you are saved. But I don't do those things or not do those things so I'll get brownie points with God. I do those because I am a Christian and I want to please God. There's a huge difference. And what we need to be careful for, for ladies and gentlemen, is teaching people that somehow you're right with God because you're not doing all these things or you are doing those things. That will destroy the very fabric of freedom that we have in Christ. Galatians says this, let me read it, Galatians 4.4, 4, but when the fullness of time was come, God sent forth His Son, made of a woman, made under the law, to redeem them that were under the law, that we might receive the adoption of the sons, and because you are sons, God has set forth the Spirit of His Son into your heart, crying, Abba, Father. Now look at Romans chapter 6. Go back to verse number 6 now. We're working our way backwards just a moment. Knowing this, that our old man is crucified, Romans 6, 6. Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve, what does it say? Serve sin. For he that is dead is free from sin. Now we be dead with, if we be dead with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him. Knowing that Christ being raised from the dead, dieth no more, death hath no more dominion over him, for in that he died, he died once unto sin, sin once, but he liveth, he liveth unto God. Now go back to verse number 17, same chapter. But God be thanked that you were the servants of sin, but ye have obeyed from the heart, from the doctrine which was delivered to you, being, ma being then made free from sin, that you became servants of righteousness. Do you see the difference? When I got saved, I was free from serving sin. When I got a hold of that, I'm not only free from the guilt of sin, but I'm also free from its reign and its power. In Christ, sin is no longer is they, it's no longer sovereign or king over me. It's no longer my master. I'm no longer a slave to sin, having to obey its every enticement and command. I have been set free. It doesn't mean that I don't slip 
what does Paul say? Look here in chapter Romans chapter seven. He says, "The good that I would, I do not; the evil that would not, that I do." There's a struggle there. Our newfound freedom in Christ is one of the most liberating doctrines of the Christian faith. Name if you look at any other religious system on the planet. It's all about what you do and doing it well and doing it often. We have Christ and we're free from the guilt of sin. Thank God. That's essential in gospel preaching and teaching. But with equal force, we must remind each other that we're also free and set free from its reign in our lives. Look, I'm not everything I ought to be. But when I got saved, there's desires that are gone. Let's teach and preach and encourage one another of the freedom we have in Christ. You know what I've learned in 19 years of being a pastor? Everybody look here. Just be who God made me to be. I am so sick and tired of trying to get into some cookie-cutter form and follow like some robot a bunch of people. I'm going to be who I am in Christ. By the way, we get saved as individuals. We walk as individuals. Where do we get off telling everybody, and I'm not talking about sinful things we should be doing or any of that, and don't go in case way too far. I'm just going to be who I am in Christ. If I want to get up here with a sword tonight and a Roman outfit and chase Caleb Lancaster around and stab him in the back and a VBS place, by God, I'm going to do that. You know what? I don't care what everybody thinks. I care if it's a sinful thing, no doubt. I got really thinking about this week. We had a prayer time. Our men, we pray every Sunday morning. I said, our church, where you and I attend, needs to reach people outside of this building. And we got to start thinking more and more of outward than inward. I was... During this week, with all these parents coming in, we have some here today visiting. God bless you. Thank you for being here. But I was trying to shake hands and be the pastor. And, you know, they probably looked at me Friday night. Well, you're the guy that's the wild man on the stage with a sword. He says, I'm not going to sit here. You preach, right? But here's the point. I found there's freedom in that. You know what we, we say, we, we older. How many of you, well, I won't say this, we're older people, us. I do a lot of reading and studying on demographics and groups and culture and all this. I do probably too much. One of the things that the younger generation wants, the millennials a little bit older millennials and some what they call Generation Z, which is the group coming after them. And I shared this with Caleb and our staff this week. One of the things they want is they want sincerity. They want it to be real. See, my generation was all about programs, doing this, 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 and this, and I'm not saying it was all wrong. I'm not saying it's wrong at all for such a time as this. But one of the good things I find about the younger generation, yes, they're coddled, and yes, they're offended about everything, and they have thrown science out the window and adopted the mommy blog on how they're going to raise their kids. That drives me nuts, by the way. But one of the things I do like is they want to hear Bible preaching, and they want to hear the truth, and they want the person delivering it to be sincere. And they want you to be the same way. I'm speaking to our older people now. Because they're tired of phony balonies that have come on and off the scene and caused all the big headlines of all the nonsense. And it's still happening, by the way. They're tired of all the abuse scandals and everything else has happened. And how they said this but did this. 
I'll check out. I'll just be an atheist. Here's the point. When you have freedom in Christ, you don't have to worry about that. You are, you're holy, you're righteous, you want to serve God, you have biblical standards, and there's freedom. Lastly, as we move on, we must realize we're strangers in this world. And I'll close with this. I want you to look at this. John 17, go there quickly. See, freedom in Christ can come without a cost. Jesus is speaking to John here. I pray that thou shouldest take them out of the speaking to God in this prayer. I pray not that thou should take them out of the world, but thou shouldest keep them from evil. Verse 16, don't miss it. They are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. We're fellow citizens with the members of God's family, but we're strangers here. We're pilgrims. Peter says, because of that, we're to abstain from worldly lusts. And, and John even goes further, and he says in verse, chapter 2, verse 15, Love not the world, nor the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is of the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life is not of the Father, but of the world. And the world passeth away, and the lust thereof, but he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. We can't be like everybody else. We're strangers. We're pilgrims. 1 Peter 2.12 says this, Having your conversation honest among the Gentiles, that whereas they speak against you as evildoers, they may be your good works, which they shall behold, glorify the God in the day of visitation. I mean, I know. I've been a pastor for a long time. I know families that have been separated because of the Bible and what you believe about God's Word. You're a stranger. You're a pilgrim. You're not like them. Let me give you an example. I know when you go on vacation, we just we go on vacation, we take our family to church. That's like foreign. It's not because of some legalistic tendency. If we don't go to church, we're not saved. We go to church, God's gonna put a mark against us because we want to serve the Lord. We want to have our children in church, even when we're on vacation. And we'll do that. We go on vacation in the summer. And that's foreign to a lot of people. There's activities we don't allow in our house. There's, there's language we don't allow in our house. We don't allow alcohol in our house ever. I know there's a lot of the new thinking now that's out the window, but I, I believe that That's still there. When I'm at work, when I was at work, I didn't want to listen to nonsense. When I was at work and I found that men were having affairs with women, which were all over the place, by the way. I just drive me nuts. You know what I found out? After they found out I was going to tell their wives, they stopped telling me what they were doing. I was just as green as a cucumber. I thought that if a guy was having an illicit affair that I should tell his wife. And I found out my boss didn't like that one. Not because he was doing it, because he thought I was in or me, but I'm a stranger and a pilgrim. That bothered me. By the way, that'll bother unsaved people too. I don't think that's just limited to Christianity. But here's the point. We're strangers because, because of our new life, because of who we are. We're strangers. So what am I asking you to know? Simple. Look here. And we're done. You're very special to God. You're free from the guilt and power of sin. And you're a stranger in this world. Now that ought to light your fire right now. 
Let's all stand together, please. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time. We thank you for the Lord Jesus Christ. And Lord, I pray for our people here this morning.